Welcome to the Jay Martin Show. If you're new to the show, my name is Jay. I'm an investor. I'm here looking for the smartest home for my cash. If that sounds like you, then I think you're going to like what we do here. My guest today is David Wu, who is arguably the most storied analyst I've ever had here on the program. During the last 20 years, he's been hired by pretty much every major bank from around the world, from New York to London, to Central Europe, to Africa, the Middle East. At one time, he was probably the highest paid analyst on Wall Street. And today we get into the big question, are we heading towards World War III? And uh, David has a take that I didn't expect on this, very pragmatic and I thought quite thoughtful. So I know you're gonna enjoy this interview. Now, before we jump in, I have a special announcement. On November 30th, I'm hosting an online conference called Crisis and Chaos, the Changing World Order. And I will be joined by insiders from the Secretary of Defense, from the White House, from mercenary groups, from the Navy SEALs. We've gathered an amazing roster of insiders who will help me answer the question, are we heading towards World War III? And if we are, what does that mean? The roster of talents at this event is higher profile than anything I have ever done in 20 years of building investment conferences all around the world. So check out crisisandchaosevent.com. It's on November 30th, and this is going to blow you away. I promise you that. But first, here is David Wu. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, here I am with David Wu. David, it's great to have you on the program. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Thank you for making the time today. Thanks for having me. So I want to start with a really big question to open this up, and then I'm just going to pull on threads. Um, are we heading towards World War III? Um, I don't know. I mean, I might have said differently basically a few months ago, but I kind of feel like, you know, especially with the polls, suggesting that very likely that we're going to get Trump back for the second time. It makes me feel a little bit better about the possibility of World War III, because as you probably know, that Trump was the first president since Jimmy Carter, who did not enter into a new war or actually escalate an existing military situation as far as the U.S. is concerned. Yeah, that's a different answer than I've heard before. So you hold a lot of your conviction on that outcome uh, focused on the United States' next president. No, listen, I think at the end of the day, you know, to me, it's very clear, you know, like, you know, you know, the reason why we're now on the verge of World War Three has a lot to do with, number one, the fact that this administration is beholden to the defense ministry. Number two, that you've got this very toxic, basically cocktail of, you know, the progressives and neocons, okay, sitting in this administration. And these two things have basically brought us and then I think a bunch of very sort of like misguided, you could argue the naive notions about how the world is supposed to work. I think the great thing about Trump is that he's none of that. He's not beholden to the defense industry and he's a businessman and he's a pragmatist. He's a realist. Actually, Trump is the first realist president since Richard Nixon. Okay. So from that point of view, like it's a very, very different point of view of the world. It's a, more about creating win-win situation between U.S. and adversaries. It's about basically thinking about what is in the best interest of the average Americans as opposed to what's good for the elite, what the ideal of the elite, what the aspiration of the elite is, so and so forth. The fact that Trump is amoral in that sense, I think actually makes him, I think, you know, someone that I think is going to safeguard peace and stability. What is it about his background, his area of focus, or who he is that makes him that outlier? I think, first of all, you know, remember, like, you know, like, you know, Trump is the businessman. What it means is that a businessman is someone who actually understands how to strike deals. I think, mean, Dave, you know how to make deals without going to war. Guess what? It's better to do it that way. It doesn't make Trump actually, you know, a sort of someone that you can basically walk all over him because he's a very tough negotiator. But again, you know, at the end of the day, being a tough negotiator, being a tough negotiator makes no difference if you cannot ultimately seal the deal. So I think from that point of view, Trump knows how to seal deals without having to basically go to war. And I think that is the most important thing. If you look at U.S.-China relations, for example, there's no question. Like, you know, you just think about this, right? Now, U.S. is literally under Biden. We're about to go to war with China and Russia and I don't know which other country. But Trump, think about this. 
Trump, whenever he saw basically Xi Jinping, you say, oh, well, Xi Jinping is my best friend. He's a great man. Whenever he saw basically Putin, he would say, well, Putin is a great man. And guess what? He's my best friend. Guess what? Under Trump's watch, China and Russia never got to got into bed together the way they have since the Biden administration. So from that point of view, Trump always understood that the worst thing that could happen for the U.S. is if China and Russia decide to join forces. And he, in very effectively, were able to keep them as far apart as possible. It was not, again, until Biden came along that all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. So I think from that point of view, understanding your enemies, how to basically, you know, sort of keep your enemies in check without going to war, it takes a great level of, I think, common sense, maturity, and basically business acumen, all of which Trump's got certainly a lot more than basically Biden or any president, I would say, in recent decades. Can I walk this back then for a minute and ask you if Trump was still in power, given his relationship with Putin, given his stance on Ukraine and NATO, do you think the hot war in Europe would have broken out? Of course not. There was no way, because there's no doubt in my mind, the reason why, the reason why we have this war in Ukraine it was very much at the instigation of the U.S. So from that point of view, I'm completely on the same page with people like, you know, John Mearsheimer, OK, at Chicago. I think there's no question it was the insistence of the U.S., OK, for the inclusion of NATO in, you know, of, of Ukraine in NATO that provoked Russia into fighting a defensive war. Yes, I do believe that Putin is fighting actually a defensive war in mm -hmm. order to stop basically NATO from basically bring Ukraine into NATO. And I can tell you why that was the case. The reason is very simple. If you, I still remember this, this was like in 2000. In 2000, I remember the big story that basically broke out suddenly with the fact that, oh, wow, you know, you know, Russia just tested, okay, launch tested a hypersonic missiles, okay? And then if you remember, I think, you know, Pentagon was literally like, completely uh, on their knees begging for forgiveness from U.S. Congress that was grilling the Pentagon saying, how is it possible we left ourselves to be basically left so behind, we're defenseless, we're behind basic development. And then I think somebody, some smart guy, you know, or not so smart guy in the Pentagon cook up this idea, let's get Ukraine into NATO ASAP so we can basically deploy U.S. missile launchers directly on Russia's basically border so that we can temporarily neutralize Russia's basic advantage in hypersonic missiles. So from that point of view, when you're talking about when Putin saw that you know, the U.S. was ready to do something like that, which means that, you know, U.S. missile can hit Moscow within 15 minutes, there was no way he was going to allow that to happen. So I think that was really the issue. Whereas I think with Trump, they would have been they would have been able to negotiate. They would have been able to work something out. Whatever they would have done, I know that they would have been able to avoid a war. It just in the case of the U.S., they said, "Well, it's about autocracy. It's about dictator. We don't deal with basically dictator." I still, if you recall, in 2020, okay, before they actually signed the trade agreement, the Phase One trade agreement, Trump and basically China, you know. We had the protests in Hong Kong breaking out, and Trump actually said, you know what, that's not my problem, okay? He said, you know what, I'm elected as president of the United States, not president of Hong Kong. You know, let somebody else worry about the fate of the students and the protests and so on and so forth. Yes, Trump only thinks about what is good for the U.S., especially for the average guys in the U.S. So from that point of view, like, you know, that is the right instinct if you want to avoid conflict. And this is why I'm saying that for me that the Ukraine war makes no sense whatsoever for the average Americans. And moreover, I think the Ukraine war in the end, the real casualties of the Ukraine war obviously is Europe. OK, from that point of view, there's no doubt that U.S. sacrifices its most important allies Okay, on the cross in order to basically, you know, Weaken Russia, whatever they're trying to do, weaken China, and so on and so forth. But again, this is why it, it, it's such a huge mistake. And I just don't see Trump. I mean, I mean, again, I, ultimately, I judge people by the results of their action. If you look at what Trump did in the four years he was in the White House, this is basically very, very, basically amateur mis mistake that the Biden administration has made. I'm Jay Martin. On November 30th, I'll be hosting an exclusive live online video event called Crisis and Chaos, The Changing World Order. 
I'll be joined by some of the world's top military experts, geopolitical analysts, and economic advisors. They'll be answering my questions and yours about the cascade of global crises since COVID-19. This event is for anyone trying to make sense of our crazy world. Find out what could be coming next and how you can prepare your mind, your money, and your family. Crisis and Chaos, The Changing World Order, an exclusive live online video event on November 30th. Click below to purchase your ticket now. Uh, okay, I need to get you to um, double back on, on one statement that you made just so I can understand it more clearly when you said that uh, Russia is fighting a defensive war. Now, I can create my own thesis around that. I mean, as I understand Russia's defense historically has always been land, just copious amounts of land. This is what kept Napoleon out. This is what kept Hitler out, is the uh, the massive traverse between Russia's border and, and Moscow. And so that land obviously has been compromised with, you know, Balkan states and et cetera. What do you mean when you say Russia is fighting a defensive war? I'd love to know. I mean, just think about this. Okay, by the way, I mean, this is something like, let's think in terms of numbers. You know, as you all know, basically immediately after, you know, the uh, Hamas attack on Israel, Israel mobilized around 350,000 reserve soldiers. You know, that's on top of the 150 active, basically, uh, soldiers. That means like they now have an army of 500,000 who are ready to basically go into battle tomorrow. Okay. Now, if I ask you, I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but if I were to ask you, like, how many Russian troops are fighting Ukraine? a country that happens to be also the second largest in Europe after basically a Russia, okay? With 2,000 miles of front line, you'll be shocked if I tell you that there are only 100,000 Russian troops fighting basically on the front line. And let me tell you this. I mean, in fact, Russia went into Ukraine with only 150,000 people, okay? Now, do you really think that Putin is so dumb that he's sending only 150,000 people if his intention was to occupy Ukraine? I mean, let's put it this way. U.S. Army textbook actually makes it very clear. If you ever want to occupy the country, you need a ratio of around 2 to 3% relative to the size of the population. Okay. Russia, you know, Ukraine's got a population of like 30 million. So you literally need to have, let's say, a million troops, Russian troops on the ground, if you really want to occupy Ukraine. Russia right now has got 100,000 people in Ukraine. Let me tell you this, it is very clear that Russia's intention, you know, they're not interested in taking over all of Ukraine. They're only interested in annexing those parts that are primarily Russians anyway. And in any event, they didn't even want to go into basically those parts. What people don't realize is in the three months leading up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Russia basically sent an ultimatum to Washington and said, you know what, if you, you agree that Ukraine will never become member of NATO, there's no reason for us to go in. The U.S. just basically said, go fuck yourself. And that was the end of the story. So I think from that point of view, as I said before, Russia did not want Ukraine to become a member of NATO. Just like, you know, the U.S. didn't want Russia to deploy missiles in basically Cuba in the middle of the Cuban crisis. Well, for that matter, if basically Canada were to become an ally of the Soviet Union, you know what? It would have been deemed completely unacceptable for the U.S. then. So from that point of view, that's what I said. You know, if you think that the missile, the Cuban Missile Crisis, in some sense, it was the U.S. fighting a defensive front against Russia, you know what? I would argue Russia definitely was fighting a defensive battle against basically, you know, against basically uh, Ukraine in, in, in given the situation. So... I want to I want to walk through the hot spots that are front and center for you right now. So I'll take uh, take what you shared thus far at, at face value, and I think you're you're probably right. And Trump was a very anti-war president. He's very antagonistic from the podium, which led people to believe he was probably the opposite. But in reality, he's a businessman, and uh, war is bad for business. Um, it's a mistake that uh, people often think war is stimulative, but it's destructive by nature, and so it's opposite of productive. But anyways, if you think through the conflict in Ukraine right now, if you think through the conflict in the Middle East or the tension building in the South China Sea, David, do any of those strike you as the potential most important tipping point right now? Let me tell you this. I, I, I'm not that worried right now. In fact, I think you know geopolitical risk premium is basically receding right now. 
Okay, maybe it's going to pick up later on when we get closer to the Taiwanese elections in January, but right now it's in a recessionary mode, and this is the reason why. First of all, let me tell you this, there is no question that the Israeli army, you know, when it comes to the ground offensive in Gaza, it's going extremely well. I mean, I have to say, I'm surprised, and a lot of people are surprised. You know, I can tell you that most military experts I talk to, even in Israel, have been surprised. But let me just tell you this, you know, Israel has cut Gaza into two halves, northern Gaza and southern Gaza, and they now have full underground control, above ground control in northern Gaza, okay? And in fact, in northern Gaza, there are probably only 100,000 civilians left, okay? So from that point of view, they have now control all the Hamas command centers, and all the Hamas people are right now underground. They can't get out. It's true, Israel has decided not to go get them in the tunnels because they're probably booby traps, all sorts of things. And But the point here is that the, 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 the terrorists are now underground, and you can argue they're trapped. So I think from that point of view, you know, at this point, that it doesn't even make any sense at this point, given how desperate basically the Hamas situation is. It makes no sense for Hezbollah or even Iran to get involved at this stage, because literally, I think they would have been caught by complete surprise by the speed with which Israel has been able to close in and neutralize basically Hamas, you know, basically a military command in such a basically short time, in the space of basically two months, two weeks. And this, by the way, has a lot to do with the fact that Israeli basically tanks and armored vehicles have been fitted over the last 10 years with anti-defense armor. And so from that point of view, anti-missile armor. So as a result, like RPGs, anti-tank missiles, I think of the couple of thousand that have been fired as really tanks and armor personnel, you know, the last couple of weeks, I think only one actually hit and killed seven soldiers, but that was the only instance. And also the coordination between the Israeli Air Force and the infantry has been such that basically it's pretty amazing that the coordination has been very effective in terms of neutralizing any basically um, snipers and firing positions, well, well done basically position on the Hamas side. So that's why I'm not too worried, you know, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict side, I don't think, you know, I think, you know, the, the, I think most of the, con let's put it this way, most of the fighting is probably behind us. And then I think civilian deaths and casualties are going to start going down because the Israeli troops have already taken over. Civilians have already gone to the southern Gaza. Sure, they're going to probably also go into southern Gaza to take to neutralize a few command centers. But I think that's going to be very small relative to what they've done already now. So that is a good situation. On the Russia-Ukraine war, it's also a very good situation because thanks to Mike Johnson, the new speaker of the House, there is no way in hell that Biden is going to get more money for Ukraine into this war. Because the administration has been trying to fight to the last Ukrainian in order to weaken Russia and basically Putin. Now, thank God that the, the Republicans have some sense. They decided that no more money. Let me just tell you this. A lot of a lot of you viewers probably don't even know, but Israeli army, without you know, obviously like you know, publicizing this because it might piss off the US, they have discovered caches of guess what? NATO weapons in Gaza. What are NATO weapons doing in the hands of Hamas? Let me tell you this, that they were given, those are weapons that were given to Ukraine, that most likely was sold into the black market by corrupt, basically, generals and, you know, who knows, politicians in Ukraine, and they end up basically being used against Israeli army by terrorists in Gaza. So from that point of view, the Republicans are absolutely right. America has no, basically, business financing this war, which is basically, again, fighting to the last Ukrainian and for what? Hundreds of thousands of people killed. I think basically the blood is on Biden's hand. But the bottom line here is that right now, it doesn't look like they're going to get more money. Meanwhile, of course, as you probably know, if you follow to your politics, that Zeluzhny and Zelensky practically are not even on speaking terms anymore. You're talking about the president of Ukraine and his top general are now basically, you know, there's a growing rift. In fact, both of them are trying to blame each other for the failure of the offensive that started in June. And meanwhile, the Russians are basically slowly enclosing on Avdiivka. It looks like they will take over Avdiivka probably in the next few weeks. And I think that's what only further demoralize the Ukrainian army. I would say that, you, that the war has become very one-sided. The war is dangerous when they're equally matched. 
But at this point, I would argue that that conflict has become very one-sided. The only reason why the Russians are not sending in more people to destroy basically the, what remains of the Ukrainian resistance is because they don't want to give Congress more reason to basically push more money into basically Ukraine. So they would rather see basically Ukraine disintegrate, okay, on its own a leadership. And I think that's exactly why Putin actually is also a very smart chess player like Trump. Okay. And so the tension in the South China Sea, we talked about that the least, but, you know, so to, to summarize, you feel like the worst of the fighting in the Middle East is maybe behind us because of how dominant Israel has been. You feel like the largest sums of cash have already been sent to Ukraine from the U.S. because Republican Mike Johnson is now the Speaker of the House and he will more powerfully veto a lot of those funds. When it comes to the South China Sea tension, you're not too worried right now, maybe until the Taiwanese election is what you said, but for now, I mean, US Navy's there, but but you're not you're not worried about that hotspot right now. China and the US, the last thing they want to do is go into, I mean, they, if they go to basic blow, that's like World War Three stuff, right? So from that point of view, I think both sides, I mean, this is why they're meeting, this is why they decided to restore whatever, you know, you know, you know, the hotline between military to military. But I think the issue remains basically Taiwan. And, you know, like I'm conducting daily surveys in Taiwan, just like I'm conducting daily surveys in Russia and Ukraine, lots of other places. In Taiwan right now, 42% of Taiwanese are in favor of independence. Okay. And right now the pro-independence candidate, you know, presidential candidate is leading the poll by quite a bit. And I think, you know, I think the purpose of, you know, she's, trip to San Francisco yesterday was trying to get, you know, Biden to reiterate that, you know, the U.S. does not support independence. You know, I think, you know, that message did come across maybe not as strong as the Chinese would like, but I think that is what it is. Because at the end of the day, we have to remember, like, why did Xi Jinping go to San Francisco yesterday, right? I mean, I would argue it's not because he wanted to go. You know, because, you know, he's been a punching bag for Biden, for the U.S. administration. So he had no reason to go. OK, but what is also true is that the last three months, I mean, literally, like Biden has dispatched, you know, Blinken, you know, Yellen, Secretary of Commerce, like even Schumer went to basically China to beg the Chinese president to come to the U.S. For what reason? For Biden's reelection, because that was what it was all about was a photo op. For Biden to be seen with basically China having basically smashed China in the face, you know, a lot in the last basically two years to get the Chinese to basically put on a smile, get a picture so he can sell himself as being a global statesman. And I think the Chinese basically play along with that. What more likely still is trying to get the Chinese to agree to help basically bring Putin back to the negotiation table at a time that Ukraine looks like it's about to get overrun. But be that as it may, I think the important thing to understand is that we are now in full election season in the United States. Right. Biden is not going to do anything that's going to jeopardize his re-election. Okay? And for whatever reason, maybe it's because of pride, maybe it's because of Hunter, whatever the reason, he's decided not to basically, you know, basically drop out of the race, even though, like, you know, a lot of Democrats feel like he cannot win this election. Okay, but be that as it may, as long as he's determined he can win and he wants to run, guess what? He, his incentive is to keep everything as quiet as possible. So there's a chance for the election, for the economy to pick up some steam before the election. And maybe that could give him basically improve his chance. That is the strategy right now. This is why the U.S. all of a sudden is now, you know, sort of like trying to destabilize the situation. I mean, it's it's it's, it's funny actually how this works. It's literally having to do with the election. And all of a sudden, you know, Biden is like, wow, you know, Xi Jinping, you know, hug him, shouldering him, gave him basically greeted him outside the entrance and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, but I think it's safe to assume that in the next 12 months before the election, I think, you know, unless something really stupid happens, it's going to be all quiet on the Western Front. Forgive me if you if you mention this, but I, I understand from what you shared what Biden's motivation is to host President Xi in San Francisco. Totally get that. What is President Xi's motivation to come to the U.S.? I think he came to the U.S. basically, again, I think, you know, one reason is probably had something to do with Gavin Newsom. By the way, you know, Gavin Newsom was in China two weeks ago, you know, yeah. after a in, in 
Israel and then he flew to basically Beijing. After he came back, I was not the only one. I was wondering, like, what is Gavin Newsom doing in China? Totally. But others, you know, especially Democratic insiders are not talking about openly Gavin Newsom is actually running for the presidential election, except he hasn't got the balls to actually announce that he's doing so. And I think from that point of view, I think there is a new rapport because also basically she met with basically Gavin Newsom on this. I don't know what the situation is. But clearly, I think, you know, from Xi Jinping's standpoint, his main purpose was to get Biden to come out and said that U.S. still supports one China policy ahead of the Taiwanese election. And I think for that, as I said, it's not an overwhelmingly strong message from Biden yesterday, but at least he got it out there. And it will probably, sh- probably show up in the Taiwanese newspaper this morning. OK, OK, OK. What, what is your take, David, on the general strength of the U.S. empire today? And, you know, I, I have a lot of guests on my show who point to the call it a, a trend of de-dollarization. This is, you know, raw material transactions, global trade occurring outside the U.S. dollar system, Um you know, looking at just debt crises, demographic crises, internal unrest crises within the United States saying, we're, we've now entered the sunset years of this empire. The upcoming superpowers like China can smell the blood on the water. Now is the time to act. And a lot of these wars, whether it's Europe, Middle East, or tensions in the South China Sea, are proxy wars to continue to destabilize the United States as it's already become fairly unstable. What's your take on that that picture as I've outlined it? I wanted to say, first of all, like anybody who's actually sta- destabilized the world and de- destabilized the U.S. is basically Biden and his team of neocons. I'm talking about people like Blinken, Jake Sullivan, Robert Mauley, Victoria Newland, and so on and so forth. They've done more damage to the U.S. than in the world than anybody else. OK, in fact, actually, the sanctions on Russia is what basically led to basically dramatic basically liquidation of U.S. treasuries and the run up in gold because central banks now basically are seeking. So I think from that point of view, it's not there's something wrong with the U.S. per se. It's U.S. policy under this particular presidency that has created a lot of issues. Now, I would argue that, thank God, thank God. I mean, this is why I think I think the United States can survive one term of Joe Biden. I don't think it can survive two terms of Joe Biden. Okay. In that respect, I would argue this is the reason why I don't think the damage is permanent yet, simply because China is not in a position yet to seriously challenge the U.S. And the reason is because Chinese debt to GDP ratio today is 350 percent. We're not talking about the government. We're talking about the private sector, corporate plus household plus government, 350 percent, which is exactly the same as the U.S., except China is much poorer. Okay. In fact, China has more debt than any country of a similar income, basically, level. And so from that point of view, you know, in some sense, you could argue China's already uses chips to grow. I mean, the reason why China was able to grow as rapidly as it did in the last basically 20 years is because its willingness to lever up. But that leverage has now reached basically a very critical level. And then this is also the reason why they're not resorting once again to more credits, expansion because they realize, you know, like, you know, literally you're really looking at a house of cards. And I think from that point of view, and then on top of that, the Chinese housing market is the most overvalued housing market in the whole goddamn world. And then we don't know, we, we, I mean, I don't tell you anything you don't know, but, you know, but the Chinese GDP is more dependent on housing than any other economy in the world. So I would argue China has some serious problems. And this is why I don't think China is interested in challenging the U.S. global hegemony. This is the reason why I actually see, I mean, I, in fact, I, I see, this is why I don't really understand why the neocons are so fixated on Chinese and basically and Russian challenge of the U.S. hegemony. I mean, for God's sake, you know, the Russian economy is the size of that of Italy. Okay, so from that point of view, like Russia can barely basically take over 20 percent of Ukraine. You think they want to drive West War, take over Poland and everything else. I mean, people don't understand economics, okay, to actually be able to make such basically stupid, basically generalization. And this is why, again, we are missing Trump. We missing, America is missing people who can think in numbers, who don't think in ideologies, who don't think about the world as between good and evil, but thinking about creating win-win, basically, outcome for all players' concerns. 
I mean, there is no doubt in my mind, like, for example, I don't know, like, you know, I, you know, I mean, one of the reasons why I left Wall Street was because I felt that fake news media just went too far. I mean, listen, I was managing the top ranked macro strategy team on Wall Street. OK, I was probably one of the best paid analysts on Wall Street. I left in disgust after the election in 2020. One reason is because the media has gone absolutely insane. I mean, one of the great, basically, trade deals ever agreed ever basically struck by the U.S., by any other country, was actually the phase one trade agreement between Trump and basically China that was signed in basically January 2020, which is an amazing deal, which is a win-win deal. I can tell you in 2019, when I was traveling China, seeing clients there, people would come up to me and whisper in my ears and say, well, David, you know what? We love Trump in China. And the reason they say is because reform had slow under Xi Jinping. And Trump, by basically insisting on basically a trade deal, was actually empowering the reformers in China, who then were able to basically make the case that China needed to open up more quickly and that this was going to basically make China stronger. So this is a good example. Even Trump back in the days was, was more popular in China than he was in the U.S. because the Chinese saw that he was doing the right thing even by China. And this is why I'm saying, you know, we need leaders who can think for themselves, and for other, this is why every employee I've ever had working for me, the first thing I send them to do is to get it basically an EQ training. Okay. I mean, my team at Bank of America, like, you know, I mean, you know, I've got a PhD from Columbia. Most of my guys got PhD from Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, and so on and so forth. They all have very high IQ. But I've always said, you need to have high EQ if you really want to have a future on Wall Street. And Trump has very high EQ. It's true. He's got very big pride, and that pride hurts him. But he understands that when you're in a negotiation, you've got to think about the other person first. You've got to be able to place yourself in a position of other people in order to actually know what you need to offer to get the other guy to come around. That is a skill, unfortunately, people like Blinken, Blinken do not have, unfortunately. That's really interesting. You know, after he was elected, I wrote the, I uh, sorry, I read The Art of the Deal, the book he published in like early, mid, mid 80s, maybe. And you know, it was, a, it was a colorful narrative on how he structures negotiations and deals, but did lead you into his mindset a little bit. And what you just said about how when he enters the room, what he's thinking about is the mindset of the person on the other side of that table. You know, it's real simple. You could call that fundamental business practice, but probably lacking in politics if you've never um, had to structure agreements like that. I mean, that's probably an issue. Well, it is an issue with career politicians. Uh, absolutely. So, okay. I got to pull on one thread, though. Uh, one thing you said, just because my audience is going to skewer me if I don't, you said there's there's nothing wrong with the United States per se. Now, immediately, we just have to address, OK, except for $32 trillion in debt, except for the $2 trillion deficit, except for the cultural divisions that border on civil war, you could argue, except for the media capturing various segments of the population and skewing opinion in abstract and very divisive ways, um, except for all that stuff. So how do you compartmentalize that? And is it just as simple as, yes, that's bad, but relative to wherever else, right? And it's always a relative question. So how do you process I'm a, I'm an FX, I'm an FX guy. I did my PhD in for, on, for, on, on currency, basically, uh, on currency markets. I started my career at the International Monetary Fund. I was working in the foreign exchange division. I ran foreign exchange research at City, Barclays, and Bank of America. I'm an FX guy, and FX is a relative asset class. Okay, so my mindset is always relative. It's relative to what? U.S. relative to what? Right? U.S. has a lot of problems, but so does everybody else. So from that point of view, Americans, because I mean, so a very a lot of Americans don't even have gotten passport. They never travel abroad. They didn't never live abroad. So they have no idea how to compare. Okay, the U.S. versus the rest of the world. There are a lot of problems. I mean, Europe is dying. I mean, the problems in Europe is absolutely depressing, actually. And you know, I mean, China. We mentioned the issues and so on and so forth. I mean, Latin America. You know, listen. Actually, ironically, the one country I'm most bullish about is Russia. But that's a very, very different story because, I mean, that's a very different story. But the point here is that most, if you look at debt to GDP ratio, it's like there is no exception. I mean, everybody's sitting on a ton of debt, especially doing debt that they build up during COVID. The only country that doesn't have that much debt is Russia, by the way. Okay. And that, that's the most interesting thing. The only country that was running both a current account surplus and a fiscal surplus before the war was actually Russia. Okay. 
that Putin has been the most physically physically conservative, basically politician in the Western world. And the second one is Bibi Netanyahu. Israel also has very very low debt to GDP ratio. So from mm -hmm. that point of view, I tend to think, yeah, sure. I mean, there are a handful of countries that are probably going to do well because they're not going to be beholden to all this debt. But you know, but everybody else is pretty much in the same boat. So like you know, so that that's why you know you asked me about the dollar. You didn't ask me about the U.S. I mean, the dollar, absolutely. I think you know the dollar is a, is still okay. I mean, U.S. also because you know it's it's energy independent. It's hopefully it's going to remain this way for a little bit while longer. I don't know if that every year we say it's going to peak the Shell Oil Revolution. It hasn't. So basically, you know, this year U.S. oil production right now is running at record high. So, but but the point here is that there is still something, you know, and, and, and Europe has got a huge problem with this Muslim community, which has basically exploded out in the open the last month after the uh, Hamas attack on Israel. You, U.S. obviously has got this problem with polarization, no doubt about that. That's why I think, in my view, this is why what makes me very bullish to the U.S. last week was when the latest, you know, the New York Times Siena Post basically came out about the six battleground states. To me, that's the most insanely bullish thing about the U.S. If you, you know, if you are, care about America, okay? That is to say, you know, these are six states, right? We're talking about Wisconsin, we're talking about Michigan, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, okay? Now, what's interesting about this poll is that Trump and Biden were tied in terms of favorability rating, and to the extent that 65% of people, 56% of people said that they're you know, they have an unfavorable impression of both of them. So in terms of the general basic popularity and basically vote, they're tough. However, when people were asked, who's going to do a better job? 20 percentage point more, the respondents said Trump is going to do a better job on the economy. 15% say he's going to do a better job on national security. And then 15% say he's going to do a better job on immigration. Only 10 percentage point of people said Biden's going to do a better job on abortion. What, and most importantly, when it comes to democracy, is 48% Biden and 46% Trump. You know what that means? That is shocking. Only two percentage point difference in democracy. Because every basically mainstream media, the, the main narrative for the last three years, that God, Trump represents mm. grave danger to American right. democracy and so on and so forth. And yet, this poll shows that only 35% of Americans view Trump as a unique threat to US democracy. That is telling me that, you know what, Americans are maturing politically. They've had three years to think about what Trump did and didn't do. They have actually moved on. We all know American voters in the past were very infantile in the way they, they went about choosing their leaders. Well, the guy's good looking, the guy's well spoken, the guy came from a good family, whatever, and so on and so forth. To me, Trump, obviously, Trump is, brings out extreme emotions in people. No doubt about that. But I think that basically, to a great extent, maybe because of three years have passed, Americans have sort of seen it all, so to speak. They're now deciding, they're now warming to Trump only because the results that he delivered. And that's the most important thing. If you look at the six states, battleground states, pretty amazing. Trump is now leading in five out of the six, including, according to this basically poll, by a margin of five points. And these are the six states that he lost completely in 2020, I mean, not by very much, by 40,000 votes. But the point here is that if he just win two of these states out of the six, especially one of the bigger ones like Pennsylvania or Michigan, guess what? He's going to be president of the United States. And by the way, this is just not a New York Times Siena poll. This poll got a lot of attention because it's a New York Times poll. Look at a lot of other polls that are saying pretty much the same. And then on top of that, 22% of Blacks say they're going to basically vote for Trump, which is like a record for Republican presidential candidate, he's going to get 43% of Hispanic votes. He Last time, he's already made record in terms of Black votes and Hispanic votes. That's gone up even more. So my hope is this. If Americans, if indeed this poll, what it's telling me is that Americans have reached political maturity, that they are going to vote based on results and the track record of whoever they're going to vote for president, then actually, you know what? That's the best news we can hope for in the U.S. Because the ideological divide, which is very, very unhelpful, if that's replaced by results-oriented voters, okay? We don't care you're black, you're white, you're basically successful businessman, or you're a poor guy, whatever it is. You know what? That America is the one I want to be involved in. Okay, I have to pull on that thread one more time. And I want to step back now 
and just look at this situation through the lens of history. So I, I try my best to, when I'm looking at scenarios like this and I'm seeing all the hyperbolic headlines and forecasts and doom and gloom, all this stuff and say, okay, well, let me step back and say, what can I learn from, from history? And if we look at the last 600 years, you know, we get a taste of how how expeditious the rotation of power around the world truly is because in the last 600 years, we've seen the rise of five unique empires. Six, if you want to include France, but we've seen, you know, Portuguese empire, Spanish empire, Dutch empire, British empire, now the American empire. And so just given that compression of time, that may point you to believe that we are in the sunset years of the American empire for nothing other than historical cycles. How do you process that? And, and do you think about that? It doesn't, does it factor into your planning at all, given, given the volatility and global uncertainty that we're seeing today? Sure. I, I think, you know, I think the way I think about this is that we're transitioning from a unipolar world to a multipolar world. Okay. Okay. It doesn't mean that the U.S. is going to go down in absolute terms. It just means that the world is going to be a, probably a more equitable place. At least I hope that will be sort of the vision that will that Trump will basically, you know, essentially bring to his second presidency if he gets reelected. Because I think at the end of the day, again, you know, I think for the sake of America, okay, it's more important that, you know, the average guy manages to basically put food on the table, able to basically, you know, bring up, you know, improve his standard of living over time, send his kids to school and so on and so forth. Then for the U.S. to say, oh, well, you know, we, we're we the best, we're the greatest, we've got the biggest army and so on and so forth. That's what I like to see. So from that point of view, I would like to basically see a win-win story, okay, between all players involved. And I'm just saying, again, that's the only reason because I think, you know what, honestly, I mean, you know, is China, if China... Trump would say this probably. This is what, you know, listen, I'm not the president of China. So if China wants to be, you know, wants to re wants to retain its current political system, that's their choice, right? If the Chinese people are not happy about it, they can overthrow basically the Chinese Communist Party. It's not my job, okay? So from that, why should I sacrifice the interests of average Americans to defend democracy for Chinese people? I don't even know if they really want it or not, and so on and so forth. That's what I think is, this mindset has to basically sink in, which is that Trump, any US president, is it basically is elected to serve basically the American people and not serve the interests of the globalist elite that think that democracy is the, basically the beginning and the end of, 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 of humanity's aspiration, <laughs> okay? So I think from that point of view, that's what I would like to see. Now, I think actually in a multipolar world, I think the U.S. would do very, very well. Because again, U.S. has so many advantages, is resource rich. You know, it's got very dynamic, basically, population. And then, you know, and it's a very pro-business environment and people are very motivated. So I think from that point of view, I think if we don't have any of the nonsense, okay, that's been going on the last three years, honestly, I think the U.S. will be hard to beat. You know, I'm not saying that we have a, we haven't got a lot of problem right now. Sure, the debt problem is huge. There's no doubt about that, and I don't. And it's 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 very unfortunate. But again, you know, if we don't solve the current situation, it's going to actually get worse. Just think about this, right? If we're going right in the '70s, you were talking about defense. Defense spending was multiple of what it is today. So if you're going to be basically upping defense spending. OK, to basically engage in World War III to bring down China. That means it's going to be less money for everybody, for everything else. On top of that, basically, um, on top of that, you know, this means that China is going to be less buying less treasuries, which means higher term premium, higher interest rates, you know, you know, interest payments now over a trillion dollars on servicing U.S. debt. So there are so many things that, that U.S. and China and Russia, all these countries are so much better off working together. You know, again, that is the thing. Forget about like, you know, who's got better political system, you know, who cares at the end of the day, okay? Aren't, you know, you as an American, you should care about America rather than care about the Chinese. You just want to basically make sure you get the best, you know, for the American people. And that's what I want to see. Do you have any thoughts on how this, this, this debt pile resolves? I mean, over 300 trillion in, in global debt owed to various parties, very complex. A trillion in interest payments alone in the United States, 32 trillion in debt today. And, you know, if we're heading into, we haven't really talked about near term economics much, but, you know, if we're heading into some kind of a recession in the United States, 
you could anticipate the $2 trillion deficit is going to go up. How, how does that resolve? And do you have any thoughts on, on that outlay, David? Listen, it's not going to get resolved, unfortunately. We've seen this movie before. We saw this, we've seen this movie in Japan. And I think from that point of view, in the U.S., because what we have to understand about the U.S., U.S. has a very unique system, okay, which is that you've got two parties, okay, and the Constitution is such that the president actually has no power over how money is spent and how money is raised, right? It comes down to Congress, okay? That is the right of Congress. And then the honest truth is that what Republicans, both Republicans and Democrats, pay lip service to fiscal responsibility. In the end, the Republicans are only interested in cutting taxes, and the Democrats are only interested in basically spending more money. So both parties are not good for basically fiscal responsibility. Now, the only time in U.S. history where we get a bit of fiscal discipline is when we have a divided Washington, okay? The last time we had serious fiscal tightening was after the midterm election of 2008, okay? When basically the Tea Party, okay, basically won by a landslide and allowing the Republicans to recapture the majority in the House of Representatives. And then we had the brinksmanship that threatened to basically cause the U.S. default over debt de so on and so forth. But that deal, because the Republicans were united, okay, guess what? They were able to basically force Obama to agree on a multi-year fiscal tightening drive, okay? That really was a huge win, in my humble opinion. But that, again, was not because of the president was bribed, whatever it was. It was because you had a divided Congress, which made it possible. Also, we saw that with under New Gingrich, you know, the contract with America, that was also a divided Congress. Okay, the whole debt ceiling, the government shutdown. So that's the irony. The irony is that because the U.S. dollar is a reserve currency, because basically, you know, the U.S. can get away with murder when it comes to its fiscal policy that lesser countries cannot, right? U.S. politicians have no incentive to basically engage in fiscal responsibility because the market doesn't do very much. It doesn't drive up interest rates and that kind of thing. So from that point of view, this is why I, I'm still holding out hope, you know, like, you know, Congress now, like, you know, Mike Johnson has now, some people want to say that he kicked the can down the road. I actually think that he just bought himself. I mean, the guy basically was elected three weeks ago. There's going to be a big fight coming up in January and in February, you know, now that they passed this latter basically continual resolution. I'm hoping that the Republicans are going to come together and hold this government responsible. That is the most important thing they need to do. But I do tend to agree with you. This is the last time we're going to fix this problem because you're not going to fix this problem under a new president, by the way. Let's just say Trump gets elected. Okay, next year. You think the first thing he's going to do is, like, well, let's raise taxes and cut spending. It's not going to do that. Politically, it wouldn't make no sense at all. Okay. Yeah. So from that point of view, the only, in some sense, this is the, you know, the, the last chance we have to put the fiscal trajectory onto a more sustainable path is actually the coming, basically, fiscal fight in January when Mike Johnson is uh, is good to go. But you're absolutely right. We should be very worried. This is why gold, you know, I mean, I it's totally understandable the fascination with gold, why gold is massively outperforming inflation index bonds and so on and so forth. You know, you know, because I mean, given where real yields are right now, gold should be trading <laughs> sub one thousand. The fuck is trading here? Is mm. just telling you gold, that people no longer view U.S. Treasury as safe haven, and th and that's a real big problem. And that is the real, basically, like message we're getting from the market. And that should basically send fear into basically Biden, except he doesn't understand economics. Right. <clears throat> Look, David, this has been a fascinating conversation. I want to thank you for coming on the program today. And chatting with me and for anybody who wants to hear more from you where should we point them today no just come to basically i mean if you i mean you know i have my youtube channel david one bound if you want to come basically listen to me basically rant about the world or if you're interested i also offer a retail subscription service for my investment strategy at david onebound.com that's it okay thanks again uh this was an absolute pleasure thank you for having me Crisis and Chaos, The Changing World Order, an exclusive live online video event on November 30th. Click below to purchase your ticket now.